from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is the 232nd episode of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. In this episode, Dan Davala stops in to tell some stories about Paula Dean, fly fishing, and skateboarding. And based on the directions I gave Dan to my house, his wife realized that her aunt used to live in this exact house. You don't come across someone of Dan's generosity and character very often, so it was an absolute honor to sit down with Dan for a couple hours by the fire pit sip on some really good bourbon, and just discuss life and fly fishing. So this is Dan's story, and we're going to sit by the fire pit while you all listen to this story. All right, Happy Fan Winkle 20. We need about a half a finger and a half each here. Beautiful. There you go. That's some pure nectar right there. Every drop of this counts. <laughs> All right, so Dan, you want to introduce yourself? Last time we spoke with you, we were in the back of your shop on like a Tuesday. I believe I was recording on an iPod Touch with a built in microphone, <laughs> or maybe my old DAT. I can't remember. And now we're sitting here on the 10 year anniversary of TPFR. Cheers. Uh, that sounds good. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Rob. That's well, good stuff. It's a it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here in Rutherford at the uh, Dacha Casa Snow White. We uh, call it the Strawberry House because I already showed you the back garden there. The After straw, going to London, Strawberry House. I want to get an actual pub sign for the house that just says Strawberry House on it. Perfect. Yeah, man. So, let's talk about you're from here. Before we get into well, let, born why, and raised. Why are you in town this weekend? We'll start with that first. All right. All right. Good. Uh, well, besides to spend time with Rob Snow White at his house, as of April 1st, and today is the, uh, what is today? The 6th, right? So April 1st, 10 years ago on April 1st, nine people, including myself, gathered together at the Orvis store in Clarendon, and, and uh, that was the, the inaugural meeting or the founding meeting of Tidal Potomac Fly Riders, TPFR. So, so we are we came down. We've we've since moved to Vermont, but uh, Davalas came down here to celebrate the tenth anniversary of Tidal Potomac Fly Riders, and so um, it's just a it's 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 a a big milestone, and it's, uh, it's it's super exciting, and I'm just so thankful that it it has stood the test of time and is carrying on even though uh, i've moved along it's great to, to have folks like like rob and uh and, and trant and dalton and the gang and all uh keeping it going so we're just here to celebrate right on so you're a fairfax native yeah yeah you, fairfax uh, hospital and melody was born in fairfax hospital really? our kids were all born in fairfax hospital so yeah man kind of local that place is evolved quite a bit it's growing it's a little different than when i was born yeah i remember it like big... it was yesterday and you grew up in fairfax what was your, your um kind of introduction to fishing how'd you get into all of this well i've always been outdoors kind of a, a guy and um but i can remember i actually do remember the first time i ever went fishing and i was about five years old i believe i mean i don't know exactly the date but i think it was about five years old and my grandfather in Pennsylvania, we were up visiting my grandparents in Pennsylvania. He belonged to a gun club, which I always thought, like, well, that's the coolest club that you could possibly belong to. It's a gun club. And uh, that had a that had a lake on it that had fish in it. And so he took us fishing on the gun club just with basically, like, cane poles. And we went out on, like, a little kind of a dock and and uh, with a fixed line and, and worms and, and bobbers just sort of, like, kind of dapped off the dock. And... I'll never forget it. Actually, I never forget like the just the the first time the bob removed and the first time I connected with a fish, and it was just I was absolutely fascinated and enamored with this this idea, you know, this this kind of thing that I was fishing, and so I just really took to it, and that was um, 
no, like I said, I, I, I think I, I sort of placed the, 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 the marker at like, I think five years old with my grandfather. So, yeah, but I do remember, I, I, at least I think I do, but I definitely remember that day. When did you first pick up a fly rod and what made you pick that up? All right. That, so I was 14 when I started fly fishing and I'm 41 now. So I was 14 and I remember the first time I ever saw somebody fishing with a fly rod, uh, my dad, my brother and I, I have an older brother, two years older than me, we were at Burke Lake and that was, my dad wasn't a big fisherman. So like that was the lake that he knew. And so when we were growing up, if we were going to go fishing, we would go to Burke Lake and rent a rowboat and my dad would row us around which he just considered to be exercise because he was kind of of like the like the rocky generation drink of raw eggs and stuff and so he would take us to burke lake and and row us around and and we would try to fish and like th that was back when we would like we bought our 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 fishing rods from like fairfax hardware which doesn't even exist anymore and uh, you could get baited highs you could get bait at highs i i, I also bought a, a, a lot of my first illegal cigarettes at highs uh, but, but anyways, uh, and so my dad, my brother and I were at Burke Lake and actually if people know Burke Lake, we were, we had rode around, my dad had rode us around to the, the sort of like the boat launch that's in the, like the second boat launch, like the smaller boat launch, the one that you just sort of turn off 123 and there's the, the second free boat one. launch. Yeah. The free one. And so we were back in that cove. Like I remember it. And, uh, there was a guy we didn't know him or anything, but there was a guy that was fishing out of a canoe by himself with a fly rod. And, uh, and I actually remember that we were watching this guy cast this fly line back and forth, and it looked really cool because obviously it's like very visually compelling like to see if somebody fly cast. So he was casting into the weeds and so, I mean, like where the weeds were growing out of, out of the uh, lake with his fly rod. And my brother decided that he said, oh, hey, look at that guy, you know, and he started mimicking the fly cast with a Shakespeare spinning rod with a bobber and split shot and a hook. And he was kind of like making this back cast, forward cast. And it was like, well, you can imagine like the chaos and mayhem of like that stuff flying around. And my dad got really mad and was just like, like, you know, my brother's name is Doug. He was like, Douglas, stop that. You know, and he said that that, that guy is fishing with special tackle. And, 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 and in, a, in a way that it takes years and years of practice. That was, I just, that's what my dad said. And uh, I think that instantly it snapped in my mind where I was like, I want to do that. Because it was just sort of like this, wow, there's another kind of fishing. And it was like special tackle. And it takes years of practice. It sounded like, uh, you know, like, like um, you know, becoming a ninja or something. Right? So that's why I wanted to do it. It's the first time I ever saw it. But that was, I was about nine. And it wasn't until... I started earning an honest income mowing grasses and I was about like uh, maybe 13, 14 years old. And I bought my first fly rod when I was 14. But it started with that moment when I saw a guy fly cast. Did you ever used to go to Ed's Bait and Tackle? Yes. Before it became a pawn shop. Yes. Yeah. Ed's I Bait and Tackle. I love man. that place. I used to go there and just look at the bait. They had crickets, minnows, they had crickets, they everything. They had minnows. They had like, they had like the... Mealworms, I the think. Kind of, they had the kind of like sinks that you would have in a garage they were like had aerators and stuff and there was like minnows and like shiners and like yeah yeah my dad would take us there and i was enamored with it yeah we but so when did do you remember when it became the cash store i mean that's it moved back to the other look they built a new building and I don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah well we, i do know this that when we were in high school actually we had a we had a friend named thor how many people have a friend named thor he had thor. a brother named leaf but anyway, uh, so we had a friend named Thor, and uh, and 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 we played a we played a joke on him where we went to Ed's Bait and Tackle and and uh, bought a bunch of like shiners, you know, a bunch of minnows, bait fish, and uh, and put a tarp in his truck bed and filled it with water and filled it up with fish. That'd be pretty in cool. Fairfax High School parking lot. Well, fish were harmed in our stunt, and uh, but that was before hashtag Keep Them Wet. That was before hashtags. So who knew? So where did you go from that to inventing a special steak knife to working at Orvis? Okay, so it was not a steak knife. It was a butter knife. Yes, and I did. I, I did invent the butter measuring knife, TM. Uh, and uh, the, the, well, all right, so let's back it up a little bit. Like, I, so I was, uh, I was a uh, mechanic, auto mechanic. And when I was going to school, 
uh, I was going to school. I went to Nashville Auto Diesel College, East Nashville. That's where we were talking about. One evening during my um, broke, broke uh, trade school days, I was going to make macaroni and cheese and I needed to measure a quarter stick of butter. And I, and I actually only had one stick of butter left and it was already unwrapped. And I was like, uh, crap, man, what's a quarter stick of butter? I don't even know. So uh, I thought there should be a, a measuring tool that you can hold up against a stick of butter so you can tell how much. If you if you have a, like a stick of butter and there's no wrapper on it, yeah, and let's no face idea. it, let's face it, the wrappers, people could do a better job putting those wrappers on the sticks of butter. Like they're skewed to one side or another. If you're a serious baker. Are you salted or unsalted? Definitely salted. There you go. If you're a serious baker, I mean, and I mean serious, I don't mean like just kind of, not you know, me, just sort of like throwing it together. But like, if if you really, really, really want to know how much three tablespoons of butter is, right? Then like, you can't go by a skewed wrapper. This, these things are on crooked, and they're just not. So anyway, so it was it was on that on that day that I conceived of the butter measuring knife, and the butter measuring knife. Is effectively, it's just a knife that is uh, as long as a full stick of butter, and it has graduations along it for teaspoons, tablespoons, uh, quarter cup, half cup, right, which is basically the whole stick of butter. So anyways, uh, yeah, like it basically is this knife that you hold over top of a stick of butter when you look at it from above, and you hold it over, and you, you basically like get the measurement you want and push down, and it's got this little like kind of 90-degree tip on it that turns down and makes a mark, and you just cut it off, right? So, so I invented that. Yes, made nothing off of it. <laughs> Paula Dean could have sold that under her name. Seriously, do you, did I tell what? you this? No, the butter lady with the. No, no, no. I know. Like, I, you don't know this story. No. Like, I almost sold it to Paula Dean. <laughs> what? Yeah, I went to the show. So my brother was living in Chicago. It's like I cast of butter. Yes, basically. Butter cast. I went, I went to the. Uh, well, since this is the the uh, the, the fly fishing podcast, right? So everybody's familiar with the fly fishing show. And Somerset, and not, well, whatever it is now, Edison. Okay, so there is the Somerset of, uh, of, of kitchen shows is the Home and Houseware Show in Chicago, Windy City. The Bears. And, uh, and so I went to, my brother lived in Chicago at the time. I went and stayed with my brother, and I, I registered for and went to the Chicago Home and Houseware Show, which is the ultimate housewares thing i went there there was like all kinds of like celebrity chefs you know there's like awesome brown and all that and like paula dean was there like doing her thing doing her show and stuff like that and uh and, and showing off her um uh whatever 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 she was selling at the time right and so i actually waited in line for a book signing for paula dean and waited until like i uh, waited through the line for it was a long line and when I got up to meet her, I didn't have a book to sign, and I just pitched my product. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, and like, and like, and the very first thing she did was was started playing with my beard. She was like, "Oh my I gosh, look at oh my out. gosh, look at your beard!" And, and her husband was right there. I mean, so I felt like it was okay. I mean, but she was like, "Can I touch your beard?" And she was touching it and stuff like that. And I, I'm calling you Moses. Well, and I said, like, I was like, I was like, oh, you know, hey, I I have this thing. I think that it would complement what your you know your your product line and everything. I showed it to her, and she's like, "You know what? Come and see me at three o'clock over by the Virginia Peanut Stand, right?" So. So afterwards, after this thing, I went and I and I met up with Paula Dean. We went to this sort of back room behind these booths and stuff like that. And I sat down with like her and her agent. You made agent. out with Paula Dean. No, 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 no. I sat down with Paula okay. Dean, and and her agent, and uh, we discussed this thing. And I like had my butter measuring knife and and gave her my business card and everything else like that. And uh, did and, she smell and, like lard? No, she didn't. She was delightful, actually. And um, smell like grilled cheese. Uh, shout well, also shout out for like you know she had a, she had her little part in the in the movie Elizabeth Town. I'm a big Elizabeth Town fan. It was a good movie. But uh, but anyways, um, she uh, she was really really into it. She was really into the idea. What did you do, Booker's? It's really hot. Well, I told you it's like it's like a it's like a hundred and thirty proof. Oh, it's the opposite of the it's pappy. It's not pappy. I can it's see not, my that's breath why I now. Said we started with the pappy. Which, by the way, what a guy Rob Snow Aid is who has this pappy. is only a small amount of it left and saved it for this time, which yep. I'm very, very thankful for. 
but anyway, so bottom line, long story short, um, it was uh, it was a very very close. I was very close to selling the butter measuring knife to Paula Dean. Yep. Uh, so fast forward and the, the, the invention thing, although albeit very fun and a very good learning experience, wasn't necessarily going to going anywhere, uh, monetarily. So I went back to being a mechanic and it was during that time where I had this epiphany. Uh, we were actually part of our, our church small group. It was like, there was a, there was a gal who was, who was in our group who was, all she was enamored with horses, and all she wanted to do was work with horses. But she was working at Starbucks, and she was sharing with the group like she just wishes she could work with horses, but she didn't have the money to go become a vet and all this other stuff. And I said, "What are you talking about? You don't have to be a vet to go work with horses. If you want to like, if your passion is horses, you want to work with horses. Why don't you just go and like work at one of the stables? You know, like just just to the west of here is all this horse country, right? Why don't you just go and like be around horses?" And it was like a two by four in the face for me, like where I was like, "I'm, you know what." Why am I being a mechanic? Like, I was not never really, like, a car guy. I wouldn't read, like, Car and Driver or anything like that. And, like, uh, it was just something I did because I was, like, into problem solving and everything. And what I really, really, really have loved for my whole life is fishing, fly fishing. And so when I was – when I gave that little piece of advice, I realized that, like, wow, like, I should be making a living somehow. I don't care how. It doesn't matter how, but in fly fishing somehow. And so – that was very convicting and so how, how'd you show up at orvis that one day as fishing manager uh so so it was off of that night and off of having this this major epiphany this major, major revelation that like i should be somehow making a living at what i love um i i knew i was already a like a customer of orvis i was like i i knew orvis and and i thought well that there's an avenue like there's a possible avenue and so i i sort of i i looked at the moment, or I guess I called because that was back in, well, I wouldn't say pre-internet or anything, but I mean, it was like, you didn't just kind of look online for stuff then. And so like, I, I think that I, I think that I just sort of called up, maybe I called George over at Tyson's or whatever. And I, and I said, I was interested in a job. And as a matter of fact, they were hiring a fishing manager in Arlington at the time. So I put in for the job and, that was um, after Dave. Yeah. After Dave, after Dave. Wow. Good memory. Really good memory. Dave was like a dentist or something like that. Yeah. So it was I, after Dave. I miss Javier. Hmm? Javier. Uh, well, Javier came along, you know, a couple of steps into this story. His wife made some cookies. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, like, I, so I, I pursued this job as a fishing manager because I knew if I was going to do it, it was going to have to be full time. It was going to have to be like a, like a job I could at least pay the bills with. At the same time, I was not necessarily happy as a dealership mechanic, so I put in for a job with Fairfax County to be like a fleet mechanic because I was like auto and diesel trained and stuff like that. And I got that job too. So I got the job with the county with a very favorable shift and like, you know, a pretty reliable future. And I also got the job at Orvis and I had to choose between the two. And that was that was 2008. And so, yeah, I chose the Orvis job and uh, that was that was over 10 years ago. About eleven years ago. I mean, eleven years in June. So happy I did. Yeah, man. That's how we met. Absolutely. Yeah, you were sort of just enigmatic in bringing people in to the shop and making local fishing. As I consider you the godfather of like tidal Potomac fly fishing. Ha! With the two-handed. When did you become like analytical about lines and the two-handed rods? Because that's where you started really bringing people in. Like, wait, there's this whole other method that's not fished here, but I can fish here to my advantage with it. Hmm. Yeah, so, well, about lines and stuff, what's kind of cool is before I worked for Orvis, like, as a mechanic, I was very, you know, very tactile and hands-on. And so I was really, really, really into tackle and gear. Like, I'd get a reel, I'd tear it down to take everything out of it. I mean, these aren't freaking automatic transmissions, so it's pretty easy to take them apart. And uh, I just like to know how things worked and what was inside them. And then when it came to lines and rigging and stuff like that, like I just, I, I just was the kind of guy who um, having a shop rig something for me just didn't even feel right. Like I, I like to do all my own knots and rigging and stuff like that. So I was pretty enamored with lines and knots and kind of setups and stuff like that before I worked for Orvis. 
uh, when it what, comes... What did you fish for before Orvis? What was your jam? Like, what got you going? What was your, like, targeted species? What, uh, well, what, what would keep you up at night thinking about catching? You know what? That's a great question. So, I think one of the most... Or, or some of the most hallowed ground for me as a fly angler is uh, is Bull Run up in like Hemlock Overlook. Historically known for the Battle of Bull Run. Uh huh. Yeah. Major first battles. Um, and Which, I gotta say that actually, like that's really where I cut my teeth in stream fly fishing, like wading and fishing. So like, I I still I remember the first day I ever saw Bull Run there. Some of my friends knew about it, and it was before I could drive, and so they drove. We got out there, hiked the trail down, and I'll, I'll never forget, like, the first, and I had my fly rod with me, and, like, I just, I'll never forget the first day I laid eyes on that piece of water, and it was just, it was, a, it was the conditions were really good, so it was nice and clear, and it was flowing, and there was a little bubble line and stuff, and there were fish, I could see everything. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's the kind of place where it's like, you know, that was like wet wading and, you know, cut off jeans and, and old tennis shoes and stuff like that, and, like, I just, I think that to me that that feeling and that experience, and when I think about it even now, that is that is like the epitome of just sort of the magic of fly fishing. Like when I think back to that time, when I think back to like laying out a fly line, having it land, having the dry fly just sort of like float and twitch a little bit, and then having a bluegill come up and make that characteristic little smack noise that they go. You know, the that little sound, sound, right? Exactly. It's like a... And, and, then, and then the sound of the line ripping off the, 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 the water and then coming tight, just... Right? And just... You know, there was probably a couple of summers of my life where every moment I could spend at Bull Run was like that, that sound of like... You know, just that over and over and over again. And I just... And... and you know, that was, like, nice for, like, bluegills and things like that. But then it was, like, there were some big bass in there. So we'd throw poppers up in there, like, me and my buddies. And um, and, and then, then I started to learn how to fish in the current, catching smallmouth and stuff. And so I, I guess, like, for me, when I started fly fishing, uh, it was this other method. But it was for the purpose of catching the same species of, like, you know, warm water fish. Largemouth, smallmouth. Bluegills, brim, crappy and things. Like I that. had no idea any of that was there until you. Mm -hmm. I'd never been there until that Orvis 201 class. That was that's one of the most magical places that that I know of. And for me, I think that's also like a philosophical thing, and maybe one of the things that that made TPFR happen is just that there's several different types of folks, um, and I, I mean, no no judgment on any of them. It's just kind of like. There are folks, and, and I understand that there's a whole part of fishing, which is like the whole tight lip, like don't talk about your spots, like secret, I can tell you, but I have to kill you kind of stuff. And like, uh, that was never me. Like, I just, I kind of, I kind of have always looked at, uh, I've, I've always been sort of a working class guy, and I've always been a, a, a public water kind of a guy. And so I've always looked at it like, you know what? As much as I would love to fantasize that I could fish anytime I want to, anywhere I want to, um, the reality is I'm not going to be on the water uh, seven days a week. And so that that public stretch of water right there in Bull Run is not doesn't belong to me any more than it belongs to somebody else. And I was led to it. You know, I had friends that, that brought me there and... Uh, I've just always looked at it as a total blessing to be able to share with somebody else something that's been shared with you. We get this idea sometimes that like that like we earned something or that we um, figured it out ourselves and in reality like like figuring something out is probably a cumulative uh, effort. Like it, it, it's built off of bits and pieces of knowledge that you've gotten from other places. And even if you put it all together and crack the code, it's not like if we're being honest with ourselves, it's really not something that that we ourselves invented, you know. So, so I was always of the mindset like if if you if you know of something of great value, and it's something that is not private, like it's it's, it's public land, then like 
one of the very best things you can do is share that with people. And nowadays, I think that, you know, the Internet's really killed a lot of stuff where people get mad because, like, somebody posts something online and the next thing you know, 10 people go there or whatever. But, you know, before all that, it was kind of like you, if you had this opportunity to share something of value, of, of great value that meant something to you with somebody else, it, it, I don't know, it just always just felt good to do that. And so that was really kind of a lot of a lot of what TPFR was was built on was just that idea of like there's just water there's there are these opportunities and like share it with other people and have them go experience it as well so do you miss sending people out to fishing spots yeah i do i mean now in my role which you, we can you're talk sending about, them out to like exotic spots. yeah right right which is which is a whole different a whole different ball game so i still on a daily basis i speak to people that I either have gotten to know or I don't know yet. And based off of experience or knowledge that I have of certain places, like I help them figure out what's the place or what's the right match for what they're looking to go and do. So, I mean, in a way, I'm still doing something similar. It's not, it doesn't have that local, that local feel, which is like, you know, you can't duplicate, like you can't, I'm not a Bahamian, so like when I talk to people about Bahamas, I'm not talking about my home. Whereas here, with Potomac and with the tidal Potomac River, and also with like Bull Run and with Burke Lake and these other places, it's like that's all just that home. And you know, maybe why I look at it is like that kind of hallowed ground to me. But um, uh, but yes, to answer your question, I definitely miss the local aspect, and being here. Uh, What's so nice about it is that you always had people who were coming to the area who were new. They moved here for, you know, for a job or for... With, uh, with my clients, I always ask, because none of them are from here. Right. Job, relationship, or grad school. Which yeah. one brought you yeah, here? Yeah. And it's always one of the three. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, you got lots of, um, uh, lots of government or military folks, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you all for... For your service um you know people who would come for three years you know they would come to one of the forts one of the bases and and i just i always loved that always valued that that i i could tell right away when somebody came in i didn't know who they were they didn't know who i was after a few minutes time talking i'd find out like oh okay cool they're here from they're from colorado or they're from you know other you know even other like major destinations like montana or whatever you'd, you'd have folks always kind of being like yeah, I guess I'm not really going to fish for the next three years or whatever. And it was just like my favorite thing Wait, in the I world. can fish while I'm stationed here? It was like here? my favorite thing just to... So, there was a mom today at the soccer game, my daughter, and I was like, oh my gosh, look, there's an Osprey over your shoulder. She's like, V2 Ospreys? I love that plane. She turns around, <laughs> she's like, wait, it's a bird. Her husband's a C-130 pilot. Uh huh. And they're moving to the Cotswolds, where I was just at, Wow. in like three months. Yeah. But yeah, like the term osprey to some people in the neighborhood is completely different. Yeah. Not a bird. It's a marine plane. You know, we were talking about this town earlier and like, I mean, earlier before this podcast, but I mean, we were just hanging out and one of the craziest experiences that I had in the shop uh, when I was working at the Arlington store, I had a guy who had taken one of my fly fishing schools and had taken a couple of casting lessons and stuff. And... His name was Doug, and he was um, he was really like, he was really bummed because he was getting ready to be assigned for three years, State Department, and he was getting ready to be assigned, and he was going to um, uh, where was it? Uh, oh man, I'll think of it in a second because it kind of makes the story. Um, but anyways, so he was assigned. He, he had his assignment. He was doing some research. And he knew he was going to be away from everybody that he knew and stuff like that for like three years. So he wanted to um, get a couple of fly rods. He had taken the schools and classes. He knew how to how to fish. He was in the shop and he was kind of like getting getting kitted up and stuff. Another guy came in the store and was picking through like the flies and stuff. And we got to talking. And it was actually the dude from the State Department who was coming back from that post, location. That post, yeah. And... I couldn't believe that, like, in this, like, one little pinprick of the universe, 
you know, the Orvis store in Arlington, Virginia, that like these two guys were crossing crossing paths. paths at that time. It was absolutely nuts. I mean, and and, uh, and and so they got to talk and exchange information and stuff like that. And like, uh, and the one guy was telling telling Doug like this place and this place and this place. You got to go eat here. Don't eat, go to that place. It was. Um, you need size eighteen caddis. Yeah, yeah. It was Montenegro. Montenegro. That's a That's pretty cool place to go. Yeah, yeah, Montenegro. Yeah, there you go. I'm glad Casino that I Casino Royale. The, uh, what, uh, what, by the way, where's this Booker's? Booker's there you go. There. Knock yourself out. Yeah, the uh, Rob's brought out a very nice bottle of Booker's yes, as well. Which... The neighbor's boss was retiring and yeah, this is, didn't this want is... it, and I ended up with it. 64%. So it's 128 proof. Came in a wooden box. Well, something like that you have to put in a in a wooden box or it'll burn its way out. Like like it The Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, so I was just gonna say. Hundred percent exactly <laughs> what I thought of. You bet. So uh so anyways. Uh, yeah, so that was just a, the, you know, that Montenegro thing was just like one of the most amazing things and and I think like we can think of story after story after story when you're when you're involved in this small world, you know, but let's face it, I mean the world is the world. It's a big world out there. And when you're involved in this thing that we're all so passionate about, this fly fishing thing, uh, you you really do. I mean, like those those stories, as crazy as they sound, are like they're just kind of part of what what you do. It's just it, it's incredible the the how knitted together everything is, and how you know how you meet people you would have never met, like and how back to how right. we met, you know. So how did Urban lines come about. Just people come into the shop with an idea. So urban lines, yeah, man. Urban lines. This is a pretty simple one. Um, so what happened is uh, a couple of people who were who were uh, pretty pretty regular customers and who had become friends, uh, Nick and Cami Swingle. They were you know, they were they were just a, a great example of people that I met because they would come in the store. And I liked them, and you know they liked me, and it was just sort of. That's what's so funny to think of. Uh, th there's very, it's a very, very tiny and thin line between you know customers and friends because you become friends with so many people. Well, they, I would say, they became friends pretty quickly, and at one point, and I remember, in fact, I remember some of their very first TPFR posts, and I remember when they got married, and and when they posted pictures from their honeymoon trip, and they were posting pictures from like. Um, you know, a part of Colorado where Nick's from, and uh, and I was like, man, they they take nice pictures. You know, I mean, I just remember noticing that about them. Like, wow, these are really nice pictures. And Nick was building rods and stuff, and like, was taking pictures of like the epoxy jobs and stuff like that. I was like, whoa, man, these are these are nice pictures. Well, anyways, so they were in the shop, and uh, they were privy to the fact that like. Me and Trent and like um, some of the other fishing managers and stuff in the area would like do these little camp trips and stuff. And a lot of times I'd sort of cobble these things together and we would go camping, fishing and stuff like that. The, the, the tire popping trips to the Jackson. Those kind of trips. Right. Exactly. Those trips. So, um, yeah, tire popping, you know, uh, like local law enforcement altercation type things and uh, UFOs and stuff. And so like, um, basically the, uh, they knew of these things that would happen because we would tell stories and stuff. And, uh, and I remember they were like, Hey, um, you know, not to, not to sort of impose, but like, if you're going to plan another one of these capers, you know, like, uh, we would love to be able to go along and just shoot some video because they were getting into video. Like they were getting into shooting, they were good photographers. I mean, Cammy was doing like, you know, like personal photography and like, you know, professional stuff and like weddings and stuff like that. Right. And, but they were getting into shooting video. And, uh, I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to do a trip to the Jackson river. We were going to try to catch these McConaughey rainbows that everybody talks about. Like very few people know about. And, uh, Those are the lake run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, um, which, which, so, so that kicked off our, like our first project. And it was not even anything official. It was just this, like, you guys do what you're going to do. We want to try to video it. We want to try to, like, capture this thing, right? So 
me, Tren Jones, George Layton from Tyson's, and uh, and and Tom Brown, who was the fishing manager in Roanoke at the time. The four of us put together the camp trip. Nick and Cammy came along. They shot a bunch of video. Uh, I think we caught all of like two brook trout on that whole trip. Uh, it was very cold, very very cold camping, and uh, but it was really fun. And they shot some stuff and edited it, and made a really cool little edit. And then off of that was they proposed that we shoot a video about Local this fishing. this thing, like this thing we were always talking about, the TPFR thing, Potomac, all of that stuff. And that was how, you know, that was how it really started was like the, we, why don't we, we'd love to capture that. Right. And so that was the, that was how that began. And then uh, they were newer to shooting, but they partnered up with and paired up with Jeremy Thaxton uh, Freestone pro. Media, Total Pro, had been doing all kinds of stuff for Cabela's, all kinds of hunts and things like that. And they collaborated on it. And uh, it was beautiful. I mean, well, you know, you are there, <laughs> right? It was uh, it was a very, very fun, very arduous <laughs> project that took maybe nine months or so, you know, of shooting before we were done with that. I wish the whole film was released. A I do too. A lot I of do people too. ask me about that. That's one of the. Uh, it's one of those bummers that happens, you know, in the great long list of bummers. Like that is a bummer, and that just comes down to the fact that, like, I think the way that music rights and things like that were negotiated, and like specifically for this film tour, and uh, and it was edited in a very particular way to where, I mean, my hats off to people that edit video like that. I mean, uh, Nick and Cammy and Jeremy, of course, but like. When you put that amount of time and effort and energy into like putting something together, if you were going to have to re-edit something, it's like, man, that's almost a non-starter because you'd have to like redo everything. Yeah. And so, yeah, man, it like lives on in 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 our memory and for those who were there and and for people who saw it at film tour and but that was a really cool time. You remember when they you know, when when, when that video was part of film tour and it was like to be able to watch that in the local venue with the local population was pretty was great fun. pretty great felt like being some kind of weird celebrity for yeah yeah for like uh for all of like you like, know we're on imdb <laughs> i know right yeah <laughs> so when were you like you know what let's get a a club together like a non-profit and we'll have our meeting at the arlington library and we'll raffle off a four-piece two-handed rod well and there were like 40 50 people at that meeting yeah a lot a lot turned out Again, I recorded that one on my iPod Touch. Yeah, I remember that. Um, well, so we got to go back in time when, uh, when you know, forums were a little more popular. So, like, um, you know, these were just, like, sort of a step above a chat room. <laughs> and yeah. like, And so, like, earlier in the Internet uh, fishing community days, there were forums. And when I discovered these... Uh, I, I benefited from them like a lot of us did. I mean, it was kind of like um, the people were reviewing rods and tackle and like what you needed for pursuing these fish or that fish or whatever. So it was like such a, a, a very useful resource. And it was very apparent to me that like that we didn't have a local we had this we had these great resources around, but like we didn't have like a local forum, like just kind of a. We, I, I knew that we had a community because I was in a central location in mm -hmm. the store and I got to talk to everybody as they came in, but everybody didn't get to talk to everybody. And I thought to myself, like, there's got to be a way to connect everybody with everybody. Because um, cause I was always impressed with the, the database or the knowledge base that there was. Because just like we were just talking about, uh, when you have people that are from everywhere, like if they're not from here, they're from everywhere. Well, that just means that you have all these anglers from all over the country and even all over the world that happen to show up in this area just for a period of time or whatever. Right. And I'm like, this is an incredible potential community. You know, it's not just like your, your, your. It's not like you're going to be your, your, uh, your typical deal with like ten or twelve people that are the same people and they're always the same people. It's like there are people that that know about like if you wanted to ask about 
fishing in Montenegro, there's going to be a guy that lived there for three years and fished it, right? So, um, so I figured it just really needs to be something. And of course, we have very good. We we have had and have very very good trout unlimited chapters in the area. I mean, multiple trout unlimited chapters. There's there's other there's other chapters, other conservation chapters like CCA and things like that. But there wasn't like just this kind of like general, you know, this general community that just brought in all fly anglers like it wasn't about trout wasn't about saltwater wasn't about what it's just like everybody right and so that was it like it was just this it was this moment in time where it was like this didn't exist we i felt like we needed it and um we didn't have anything in the area about that was like fff um which has changed its acronym like 14 times since but like there wasn't any fff anything going on so like i was like why don't we make an fff club Federation of Fly Fishers is what it meant back then. Uh, that's just about fishing, just about fishing in the area and, and fishing local um, local water and for all species and everything, including like snakeheads and stripers and shad and everything else. So yeah, that was it. That was the um, saw the need, also saw the potential from the number of people I got to interact with. I was fortunate enough to interact with and learn from too. And uh, then all we needed was like kind of that that thing to paste it to, and that was FFF. So that was the beginning of of the this idea. And also at the same time, there was a chapter of of TU that is no more. It was I can't remember if it was Northern Virginia Trout Unlimited. There was a weird George Washington. George Washington. Chapter. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. Um. And Bob Grove was the president. And uh, Bob, shout out if you're out there, man. And um. So I went to speak at their thing one time, and uh, shortly thereafter, they like they dissolved um, because like TU was kind of like there's already Nova TU, there's already these different, so like like we don't need that TU. So they dissolved. So um, so I got the uh, the the list at the from Bob and sort of put out there like, hey, starting this new club, and I, I think that that's partly why. That, that very first meeting at the Arlington Library where there was a good turnout was because, I mean, at that time, like, I really didn't have, except for a sign-up sheet, I didn't really have a, a, a mailing list. And I got that mailing list from George Washington TU Chapter and sort of just put it out there. And, uh, yeah, a good, good number of folks showed up. And, and the uh, uh, we, did two, we did two meetings at that location before, I think, before we launch beer ties. Yeah, so how did that start? As far as I'm concerned, we're sort of like the first group that started going to a bar and tying flies. And that was 10 years ago. Yeah, that I know of. I I don't know of others that were doing it then, but I mean, that's not a prideful thing. I, I don't really, if there were, then, hey. And we just awesome. happened to choose one of the darkest, poorly lit bars of all time to tie flies. Well, they would have us. <laughs> yeah. The uh, So, you know, I, I can't, I can't not give credit where it's due. Um, so Dalton Terrell, who's presently the president, like that was his idea was yeah, beer tie. He, that's his he, baby. It was his idea because when he was going to school in uh, Kakalaka, right? North Kakalaka. North Kakalaka. Yeah, UNC. Yeah, Farm so when he was going to UNC. Womp womp. Um, They're not playing tonight. I, well, I don't even know what sport they would be playing if they UVA's were. UVA's playing tonight. So... Uh, but anyway, so Dalton, Dalton and his guys uh, from college, they would have these beer ties, and they called it beer tie. And like, and I remember the first time when I was just like checking names, like for what to call it. And I remember like googling beer tie, and the only thing you would find would be like neckties that had beer on them, right. like like a like a. There's you know, now a tie that you can put a bottle of beer in. Did you make it up? It's not my. It's idea. not like a dragonfly lanyard. Damn, no. Still one of the best things ever. Yeah, who's some Umqua sells those. Oh no, not Umqua. Uh, Fish Pond. Oh, well, we no, know where they got it from. Yeah. The uh, actually, I got it from my buddy Jay. It was originally called the the, uh, the Canyard. The Canyard. That's clever. I like I like puns and playing. But anyway, yeah. so um so so yeah so Dalton had this idea for um for beer tie, and as I understood it then, I mean he proposed it at like at one of those library meetings, and as I understand it. And they would get, uh, you know, a dozen people or so. These were just, you know, it was a college campus, and it was like, 
even you're having a dozen college age folks at the time that were into fly tying that's pretty great but um so i thought man this is that's a great idea and um actually the very first place that i went to propose this idea to was whitlow's and you crazy well what it was actually was was um because we had no no leg to stand on we had no um precedent so they were like oh yeah you can do that here a group trip or, or a group um a group uh activity or a group event you pay a $500 deposit and you run you know x amount of a tab and if you hit this number <laughs> of sales then you don't pay the $500 deposit. You get your deposit back or something like yeah, that. It was something like that. We're a nonprofit based on fly. We, well, we had nothing. We didn't have a bank account then. Like, so, so I, I just was like, Oh, okay, cool. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, maybe someday. Right. But like, so yeah, like I walked a block over to Rira and which isn't there anymore. Not that one anyway. And, um, and they were like, oh, yeah, we'd love to have you, you know? And so, and they had this little back room, and that's where they did their comedy nights and stuff like that. Picked the slowest night for them, Monday night. Uh, and that was how Beer Tie was born. And the very, very first Beer Tie, I think we had it was 45 or 50-something people for the very, very first one. And we were just like, dang, and we're, we're on to something. something. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and we ran them there until we basically were just destroying the fire code. I mean, you know they were they they had that room was rated for 60 people i know that and um and we were we were exceeding that so we had to we had to move by then uh at a beer tie one night i during a beer tie i left walked over to whitlow's talked to the manager over there and said we have um you know 60 some people over at rira right now we need a new venue and they were like, "You're <laughs> 60 yeah, people on a yeah, Monday, right? Yeah, you Bring can come." <laughs> so uh, that's how we moved to Whitlow's. But um, but yeah, beer ties, man. You know, to round it all out, it's like that was you know uh, credit to Dalton Terrell, man, because that was uh, that was that was his idea and that was the name. Now you find them. There's lots of them all over the place. Well, because the it's a good beer idea and fly tying and you know go well together. Yeah. So when did you get the call from corporate to go up to the big leagues? going to the big show well and and you're in the travel department right do you get to travel a lot i do i do although it's not excessive i remember you caught the tarpit on the day like you're leaving uh well it's not i'm not always traveling it's not like i'm just like go bouncing around to like you know fly fishing destinations and things like that and i wouldn't even really want that because it's like well i have a family and that you know, I mean, I I, I want to be home too, but uh, but I was doing from from the store like I was arranging trips. You know, I, I just started like as you know I was there for seven years. So uh, once once you have a pretty good pretty good community going and people who um, look to you for information and things like that, well, that also trans translates to looking for places to go and destination trips and things like that. So I started kind of like partnering up with a lot of our Orvis endorsed lodges, like places that are uh, near and far and organizing group trips and hosting them, uh, which for what it's worth. And I mean, I'm not trying to have anybody cry me a river here. Um, I'm just saying that like when a lot of times people will go like, oh man, that must be nice or whatever. And it, and, and it is nice. It is. It's, it's really great. It's a great privilege and opportunity to go to places where you might not otherwise go. But if you're hosting a trip and if you're doing your job as a host, you're really working um, for people the whole time and, and, and you're there for them. And that's, if, if you, if you have the right mindset about it, that's, that's a great reason to be in it because you're you're helping people achieve their dreams and and you're helping connect them to other you know partners in other parts of the world which is pretty great so having some experience with organizing trips and leading them just timings everything and and the the right timing uh or it was the right timing when a when a job opportunity opened up at the headquarters at orvis headquarters with the orvis travel to um basically go and work within the travel part of Orvis and 
not only fostering these partnerships with the lodges, but also organizing all of the Orvis group trips and schools and things like that in these destinations and hosting some of them, but otherwise also just having the knowledge to organize them and and uh, help people get them uh, get get booked and everything like that. So timing's everything. And what about when they're like, you're going to move from crazy hustle and bustle, Northern Virginia. We're going to bring you up to Vermont where it's chill and quiet and yeah. no gridlock. Yeah, that is pretty nice. I will say, um, you know, this is, this, this here is home. Like this is where I'm born and raised. And, but, um, but I, but I do not miss the traffic. Like I, I definitely, I don't spend any part of my life in traffic anymore. Yeah, it took me an hour and ten minutes to go twelve miles to teach with Art the other night. Yeah. Fly time class. Yeah, I mean it's like I used to on a daily basis to go from Centerville, Virginia to um, Arlington, Virginia. It was twenty-two miles, but it would take me over an hour. Didn't matter how I did it, if I drove or if I took a bus to Metro, or a bus to Metro and your, metroed in. Your it was deck. still. Hmm? Could road your deck. I could in. probably skated there faster. Yeah. Go down the shoulder on sixty six on a skateboard. I hear they're making a trail. They're they're Sweet. making a new like a, a new trail like a bike trail. That would have been a possibility. But anyway, um, uh, it's funny you bring up the the transition though to like to to rural Vermont. You know, I thought all along that moving there that the most difficult transition would be that would be like going from an area where there is kind of everything. Like right now, if we decided like, hey, let's wrap this thing and let's like go and get like uh, some Thai food and like let's go hit up, uh, you know, let's go get some beers and like let's go and do some things, we could go and do it. Like uh, or if we decided to do some kind of like crazy stunt off your roof right now and we needed to go to uh, an urgent care or whatever, <laughs> we all, could do it. It's all right here. Right? Like if we wanted to go get Korean barbecue and then go get Peruvian chicken yeah, and then maybe get some kind of like – bon me sandwiches we could do all and then that go time. ice skating yeah we all, could do all, all those things. five minutes here yep five miles not yep. five minutes yep. so say. so anyways um i i thought for sure that like the the most difficult thing for me to transition to would be the, the uh, like moving to an area where there's not much of anything you know except for maybe like a a gas station and a dollar general and like you know just stuff like that you know actually the hardest transition for me was not that that was actually pretty easy. Um, the hardest transition for me was going from being in a shop environment where I was working with people who were coming in all day, every day, like all kinds of people from yep. all sorts of walks. Right? On your feet? Well, yeah, yeah, but but there's but I'm still on my feet. I'll explain okay. that in a minute. But but probably the hardest transition for me was like going to like an office environment. Like I was, I, I it, it was, I am not an office guy. I'm not, I never have been. I was like, you know, I was a, a a laborer and a landscaper, and then a carpenter, then a mechanic, butter knife designer, with a stint as an inventor, and then uh, and, and then I worked in a shop at least on the retail floor, but like, um, but like an office was just not the only office experience I had was was watching Office Space like 150 times, like, in in like one week. 20th anniversary, really? This week. Wow, wow, amazing. Uh, well, anyways, so that was the hardest transition. That was the hardest transition for me. It took me a long time to adjust. And, and granted, there are perks to the fact that, like, yes, I mean, as part of the job, like, I might go and host trips somewhere. Or I might go and explore a place that I haven't been or something like that. That's great. But still, on a day-to-day, -day, I go to work at an office. It might be one of the cooler offices around because it's, like, the Orvis headquarters and it's in rural Vermont and like it's in a very pretty place. You got a museum right next to you too? Well, we're not like right next to that. Like we're actually kind of like just down the road from there. But uh but, work route seven A, Manchester, Vermont. Yeah, I mean that's up that's up but like our our actual building. Oh, I just don't always remember that from addressing boxes back wow, in the day. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. That well that that is where the uh that's where like the the flagship store and everything is from. We are just about 10 miles from there in the headquarters, which is a, yeah, it's a three level building. Got a pond out back. It's very nice. It's sitting in the Green Mountains. It's on like a 300 something acre black bear preserve. Never seen a freaking bear there. I've seen their evidence and whatnot, but I've never seen a bear there. You got to leave some Zagnut outside. Yeah. Well, you could. I remember, Zagnut always reminds me of Beetlejuice. 
But um, not great outdoors. Oh well, great outdoors is another good one. <laughs> yeah, you, you need like a shotgun the layer. Bears. The, uh, but anyway, um, so it's a it's a it's a great um, it's a great place. It's a great environment. But like, but an office is an office. Like no matter anywhere you slice it, like an office is an office. Like, Are you in cubicles or like separate? Well, there's. Like, can you like reach over and like tap Kutzer on the shoulder? Yeah, or, like, actually, or, like, Pete, throw, actually, shoot Pete, spitball at like Jesse. So actually, Pete is like right within our like so it's like it's like cubes but like they're like pods and there are like okay. teams that work together pete's like right right in there with us and and uh and we don't do spitballs but i did make like um Take like car cast out no them. i made these like small little blow guns that shoot blow darts that actually would like like do you remember the old spud gun you would just stick it in a potato and shoot like a little plug of uh potato? i don't remember a product but i do remember making things like that in the auto shops not we the guns that shoot food. potatoes, but like you could just stick it in a potato and it would take out like a sliver. Yeah, yeah that's what we would do, but we would do it with compressed air. That's even better. Yeah, it was, it was really great. And when you would nail somebody with it, like on their uniform, like as a mechanic, like you your uniforms, it would leave like this great starch big mark. white starch spot. I would put those in my air fryer. Ooh, yeah. Do you want some samosas? I can go air fry some samosas right now. Maybe in a little bit. Maybe in a little bit. But anyway, the. Uh, uh, yeah, so. so so it's a nice environment and all, but I mean, it's still an office environment. And so like it, that didn't really fit very well. And it, it, it was hard for me. And so one of the first contributions I made up there at the home office was I built us, not just a, you know, some people might say I built myself, but no, I built us as a group. I built us a nice big bar. So, so, you know, like the beer tie, beer, yeah. tie, right? Like, so like these things mix really well. We know this. And also, there's really not a lot of bars up there, so like getting people to like, hey, let's go grab a beer, right? Or like, well, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm going like, I'm going this way, I'm going that way, right? So like, so so one of the first things I built up there was a nice big birch. I built out a birch uh, because I wanted, well, because it's everything's symbolic. It's local. It's local. I, I I at least was even back in like grade school. It's robert frost fan and like birches and stuff you know and um and, and there's a lot of birches up there right robert frost like spent some time up there uh but um and then and then stain the color of the bar is gunstock gunstock right you know we do wing shooting and, yeah. and stuff, right so we gunstock birch bar and uh and, and so i thought that was pretty cool and so it's this nice big horseshoe shaped bar and it, it actually has become kind of like a very like central gathering point we have our little little get together is there we work you know after hours so it's sort of like hey we're not gonna go down the road and knock one back so like we have we have a bar it's great so you know a lot of what's times what's a what's a regular pour there any any particular el, cocktail? el dorado el dorado 12 year rum neat on the rocks neat neat you read some like plantain chips with it uh if I'd you have them but like you know rum you know just on a little sidebar there i'm a big fan of rum big fan of aged rums uh i i learned about these things from some of the destinations and some of the partnerships that we have i always thought rum was like cat and morgan and like you know uh making a uh making a beverage with rum but these aged rums there, there's something to be said about a uh you know 80 plus proof distilled spirit that you can sip neat when it's 90 degrees out and it's delicious so if there's a favorite and if we have a a bar you know a mascot bottle of something it would be el dorado 12 year rum very very good and not very expensive i mean you know 30 bucks or do like the aged appletons i haven't had it I like appletons huh yeah, well, so um, so sometimes you know, within what like whatever the environment is, sometimes you have to adapt to an environment, and sometimes you have to adapt an environment to yourself. And I think that by building a bar at the office, I believe that we, we found a middle ground. That's team building. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Good things come of it. Yeah, so so it's good, and it's in its um, probably third year of existence. Right on. I think it's there to stay. Are there any bar snacks there? You need some biltong. We always have some bar snacks. We don't have biltong. Biltong. We were just talking biltong. is, you know, jerky, uh, a style of jerky dried meat from South Africa, which we're both familiar with. Um, but you were up at the uh, Edison show and you saw our mobile bar. I'd never seen a booth eat more than you guys. It's, you were like Brad Pitt 
If you never if Google Brad Pitt eating in movies, there are websites dedicated. But you guys had food the whole time. Like there's an uh, incident of worms at the Manchester offices. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things about working shows. Kind of feed yourself to keep off the you just need, you germs. Need to, yeah, well, you need to. Feed and that not, immune system. Not just that. Like if you're going to really, you know, be as strong at the end of a show as you are at the beginning of a show, you have to be able to keep, you know, just high protein, just kind of like good stuff going on and beer and, you know, liquor. And it's just kind of like a, if you never have to leave your spot because it's all there, uh, Hey, you know, I mean, you, you make a good showing. So like, so, but, but as you saw, like, I mean, our, our booth, our Orvis Adventures travel booth is a, a mobile version of the bar I'm talking about. Like, it, that's the, that was the inspiration of that booth. Is there an employee that can make a better drink than others? Um, you know, yes, Jody, Jody Frederick makes these, um, she makes like a limoncello and like uh, um, basically like these these uh, infused vodkas. Yum. Yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty good. And, and I, I I have to say, you know, because of the if from the crafting of something like we're 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 pretty boring. We just end up drinking like uh, Pat and kill gin. Uh, no, <laughs> Pat and kill gin. The uh, yeah, everybody argues over the Brooke Helios Town. vodka. The um, no, we all we all just most of the time just sip. Uh, some guys, sort of some sort of whiskey or rum. I could totally see Orvis with its own line of distilled spirits. Bat and Kill Gin could be a thing with like Vermont. Oh, we could do it in like we could do it in instead bamboo more, barrels instead of like Morels. I don't know bamboo staves. So instead of oak, it would have right. this like mellow. How much, dude, how much bamboo do you want? Look behind you. No, no, no. But that's I'm, the last no, that's standing. Rob, you can't age something, and it has to be Tonkin cane. It's got to be Rutherford. It's got to be Tonkin cane. Bamboo. <laughs> Rutherford. Bamboo. I will be done with this bamboo within a week. Uh, well, we'll come up with something. Right. So but, ha- let's talk about your skateboarding project. Yes. Yes. So, uh, well, I grew up skateboarding. Um it was not only our thing that we did for fun and and tried to do tricks on but but we uh it was our mode of transportation as well around here skateboarding is not a crime it is not a crime we, we were of that generation that 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 uh championed that phrase because when we were growing up around here and a lot of skaters elsewhere there were not there just weren't skate parks like they were being torn down, actually. Like, if they existed, they were being torn down. There's a stigma against skaters around here. Well, there was, but there was also just this kind of, like, period of time where, the, I, I guess, what was crazy to have learned about is, like, there was there was a time before us where skate parks and skateboarding was... was a sun on chips. Know. Well, but, I mean, you could... you There were skate parks. Right. There were skate parks in Alexandria. There were skate parks, like... So, there was a place, and, and uh, there was a time and a place... But uh, but we grew up when all of those places were being torn down for liability reasons or because they were just failing as businesses. So I never even knew that there had been concrete parks like in Alexandria and stuff that like we could have gone and skated. You know, we we would read about like Del Mar and stuff like that, like out out in California. So uh, so we wanted to skate parks and we wanted to skate transition and half pipes and things like that. But we had none of them around here. Or, I mean, for those people who knew and her from the area, I mean, we definitely, they existed, but we were just a little too young to, to go. There was Cedar Crest Halfpipe. Cedar Crest was like the legend around here. It was like at the Cedar Crest Country Club. But, but and it was a big time punk scene and like really cool. But we were just a few years behind. Like none of us could drive. We couldn't Where's get Cedar there. Cedar Crest? Uh, it's like out toward Bull Run Post Office Road. Bull Run um, uh, out toward past Manassas. Kind I don't of think area. the resting kids knew about that. No, no, no. But it was it was a thing. I mean, it made it in some of the national magazines, like like uh, Tony Hawk and them came out and skated it. Thrasher back then, yeah, it was. So anyway, um, we didn't have those facilities though, and even that one went by the wayside. Uh, so we skated street. You know, we skated 
loading docks behind Fair City Mall and like whatever we could cobble together for ramps and stuff like that. And of course, at that time, that's when there became no skateboarding signs and you know some police interactions and things like that. And uh, and so it was a, unfortunate because like we well, that was like skateboarding was awesome and we wanted to do it, but we just like didn't have a place to do it. Well, fast forward a bunch of years, I got out of skateboarding. You know, I sort of like figured I guess I got a little too old for it or whatever, and I was like working and doing all these things, right? Uh, well. At the at the the ripe young age of forty, I got back into it. You're not worried about getting hurt? No, we're not agile anymore. No, we no we are we are. All right. We, yeah, we just it just it's just that what you want to do is not fall, <laughs> because if you fall, it hurts for like way longer yeah. and way worse. So just I guess just don't fall. But uh, what's kind of interesting now is I've gotten back into this. Um, and by the way, now that I've gotten back into it, like there are skate parks. And so now I primarily skate transition. I primarily skate like half pipes and and bowls and, and stuff like that. And um, There's a pipe near Edison at the show. Yep. Yeah, skate that. We should organize a skate event at next year's Edison show. Yeah, well, I'm going to have a skate event, event on Monday at, at Van Dyke Park. <laughs> There's a good park right What's there. What time? Uh, noon. Yeah, I'll come out. I'll you there. Come out. Sweet. I, my longboard. I think my wife threw it out. Uh, I got extra boards. I brought some extras. I can only do longboard. I can, well, I'll try. Uh, try a short I'll one. Bring a helmet. Well, but anyway, so um, so so now a lot of us out of this generation. We should go to we should go to Freddy's for lunch, on Monday. Where's Freddy's? It's Uncle where the Freddy? Fr- friendlies used to be. Uncle Freddy. No, Freddy steak burger. No, Uncle Freddy is a Jerky Boys reference. Oh, jerk. Uncle Uncle Freddy. I remember hearing Jerky Boys at Jewish Sleepaway Camp or in the early 80s. It was a dub tape off a dub tape. Yeah, well, that's all. That, I don't think there was ever an original. It's and like then Jerky Boys were all just dub tapes. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Freddy. Oh, my God. So anyways, uh, the bottom line is, so the skate project. So now people like myself who didn't have skate parks, are, well, now we are parents of kids. And we are like, uh, like, yeah, there should be skate parks, you know. So I joined the, there, there's been Audrey a Moore. Aunt, Mm-hmm. Audrey Moore Park has a huge skate park. Where's that at? Uh, Braddock and 495. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And there's also, though, there's one now that actually just up the road from the Clarendon store up Wilson. There's really? one at, at Paladin Springs. It's uh, it's right near Bonaire Park, and it's, like, yeah. huge, and it's being totally redone. Matter of fact, it was at the Edison show that Senor Denito, Dennis. Denny. Yeah. He he came up to the booth and told me about. I was there when he saw you. Yeah, He's yeah, like, oh yeah. my god! It's so dead. we talked skateboarding like the whole time at the fly fishing show. He used to be like hardcore in Manhattan back in the day. Well, he's 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 back up there now. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so what's up, Dennis? Um, he um, or or the as far as the skate park goes. So so, when I got up to Vermont and when I got back into this, we had a skate park up there, and. I loved it. I mean, my gosh, we didn't never have skate parks where I was growing up. So it's like, there's the skate park it had these like rickety old ramps. I mean, they were sketch, uh, like wooden ramps with like just pieces of metal cobbled onto them and stuff. Uh, but there were some big quarters. There was a six foot half pipe, six foot tall, pretty big. I mean, 24 foot wide, really nice half pipe, but it was just a mess. I had holes in it and stuff like that. They're like, you had to drop in in certain spots to like not go into holes. So to me, I was a, like my favorite place. We would skate it all the time, but I learned that there was a project going on that had been kind of started like years back, but never gained momentum for like a, a modern skate park. And so I volunteered for the committee, and I've been on the committee for the last like year. And we are actually April 29th. We're breaking ground. We have we've hired Grindline out of out of Washington State to be the design and build firm. They're breaking ground on the 29th. Uh, and we are building a concrete skate park in Manchester, Vermont, and uh, we're building it in three phases. If we get them all done, it's going to be like seventeen thousand square foot. I heard Rosen, park. Rosenbauer's got to mean Ollie. Really? No. <laughs> How did his tattoo go over? By the way, back home. Uh, I I I predict that it's going to be the first of many. I think that that is full the, sleeve. Yeah, I think that like a sleeve's got to start somewhere, and his sleeve started. In Edison. 
So you guys gonna have like a big groundbreaking ceremony up there when that uh, all goes down? I don't know. I don't know if Golden there's, there's nothing planned right now, but um, but I mean it's a big deal. Like like to to build a you know the, you got to put it in perspective. Manchester, Vermont has, as far as year round residents, has like um, oh, maybe just over four thousand wow. people, right? Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about uh, if you get if you stand on the metro platform and you watch like maybe five eight car trains go by, that's the population of Manchester, Vermont, right? You can see that in like freaking twenty five minutes on a on a Friday. The permanent like the like people that live there year round. There are people that have second homes. There are people that have like cabins, things like that. But like. 4,000 people. So we're, we are trying to build a skate park um, that is more typical of an area that has 700,000 people. Right. If we're, you build it, they will come. Well, the neat thing about it up there is that there are there's a lot of people that do come to the area. You know, for for uh, just a visit because it's it's a it's a nice place to be. I mean, like the whole reason Orvis exists up there is because of tourism and because of people that would visit from New York and things like that. And like it still is the case, people come up there to ski, people come up there to to look at the leaves, people come up to like all that stuff. And so it's like, yeah, I mean, the, it's it's actually for a small town. There's there's always a lot going on, so yeah, to build like kind of a world class skate park. Uh, kind of makes sense, but it's a big undertaking, and it's uh, I'm stoked about it, man. I mean, it's for better or worse, we're building as much of it as we can afford to uh, this spring. Yeah. So. What's your board of choice? Uh, well, because I'm from I'm a product of the '80s, I skate Powell Peralta boards. I still do. You can drop it at Fairfax Skate Shop while you're here. Uh, I'm not maybe not on this trip, but I I actually have uh, two Fairfax um, surf shop. Fairbanks surf shop, surf shop dude. t-shirts and I, last I time we up. were in town last time we were in town which was um uh around the holidays uh, uh, uh the whole family bought us all new triple eight helmets from Fairfax surf shop nice. even though even though i could have bought them online for less you know you got to support your local skate shop it's like fly shops and stuff yeah do your kids so, skate at all yeah yeah they all skate or scoot you know scooters and stuff yeah so they all do. We actually found our scooter four. in upper four mile run. Mm -hmm. We were walking across a bridge one day and I was like, look, there's a scooter in the creek. Wow. The amount of crap I pull out of four mile run doesn't. I got an you iPhone had, X. Yeah, you always had some very interesting discoveries there. I got an iPhone X recently out of the water and I put it on eBay as broken with water damage for parts and it sold for $99. Wow. I made money off of River Charms. River Charms, man. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, man. Come out to come out to to um, Van Dyke on 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 Monday. Yeah. We're planning to shred that place up. Yeah, my kids all sort of scooter or skate, um, or both. And we have actually like so where we live now, we have a big garage, and you know winters are very long, and dark and cold, and but we have a very big garage and we have a quarter pipe in it. In your garage. Yeah, so we skate the quarter all the time. You know, put on some freaking Dropkick Murphys or Operation Ivy and just <laughs> go to town, man. I mean, it's it's That's fantastic. Awesome. It's like my favorite place in the world to skate is in my garage <laughs> with a quarter. So I'm planning on building a couple more so we can make like half pipes and stuff in there. That is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have that here. There's a couple of kids in the neighborhood with longboards. Yeah, do I've much. seen that. I've seen that. I mean, not around here, but I mean, I, I've I've seen that phenomenon. Like that didn't, that didn't really, that didn't really exist in the present form. I, I don't know when that kind of evolved, but I mean, it's like people are really into it. You know, they, they 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 put on these little like gloves with pucks in them and stuff like that, and like lay back and slide. It's crazy. Um, now that we're thinking about it, I'm pretty sure my wife threw out my Kona board from REI. Hmm. Because I was digging through the shed today. And the garage, looking for my weed killer solution with the borax and vinegar. Uh huh. Didn't see my skateboard once. Didn't find my uh, weed killer either. Well, she throws if it, stuff if out. It, if it doesn't turn up, you know, 
here's the neat thing about skateboards. Skateboards are one of the only products that you will find that have uh, completely defied inflation. When I was growing up and we would look through Transworld Skateboarding or Thrasher or whatever, you get to the page with like the like 500 decks on it. You look at all the pictures and stuff and be like, oh, I want that one. I want that one. Well, guess what? They were all 50 bucks. Look up decks right now. They're freaking 50 bucks. Now, when you do your Orvis travel and go on trips, do you ever bring a board with you just to get around town? Uh, I take a board and 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 my pads and stuff like on every to every show. And, I, and what about and like actually, if you're going on a bonefish trip just to get around town, would you bring a deck with you? Some of the roads in some of these bonefishing Pretty destinations dodgy. are difficult for a car to get around, let alone like a like you, you need like a you need like the the six wheeled thing from the Atari game Moon Patrol. What about the hoverboard from Back to the Future? When are we getting those? Still, still in the future. I can see that in the Orvis catalog in 10 years. We still have to get to the future. The Fatwood floating deck. If if it if it if if it turns up, I'm sure we'll sell it. Right. Let's, the, let's talk about some. What about some trends in Orvis? Some trends. Trends like. What are you guys going towards these days? And we got some pretty fit, like the new clear water rods don't look like any clear water rod I've ever seen. No, they're pretty awesome actually. Well, I think that everything that we we do, and I, and the neat thing about where I am is that we actually um, the adventures folks like right. travel adventure schools things like that. We work right next to the rod and tackle folks, so like we're basically all kind of one one group, and. Um, those guys, those guys and gals over there on the uh, on the on the product development side of things, are like they are they are always trying to push you know push the envelope, push the bar with like making something better, making something. And I mean, better is subjective. It's kind of like you know, fly rods these days are so good in terms of casting and whatnot. Like they all they all work really well. But even like you mentioned, the clear waters, like well, like clear waters, like compared to the previous clear waters. Like even just look at the real seats and the hardware. Like it's, not... it's like the hardware and the real seats are like way way better. You know, yeah. I mean the cork is way better. It's just kind of like those details and also also casting them. I mean they're just they're good they're good fly rods. The spay rods, the 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 clear water spay rods and stuff. Man, those things are amazing. In fact, we were playing with prototypes and stuff, and it's cool. Like I said, we have a pond out back, so you know for the half a year that it's not frozen, we cast on it a lot, and um, and it's always fun. When the the rod and tackle folks are are walking outside, they'll grab some of us from like, you know, travel and stuff like that to like go out and just cast rods and like try them out and stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a conversation all the time. Be of like, are these are these too good? <laughs> like we're, you know, we're making these at the yeah. entry level. It's kind of like, are these? Wow, I mean, yeah. So I'm I'm impressed with it. I just think that I think that like a lot of technology, you know, just like your computer and stuff here. It's like I think that like like it technology builds on technology and so like as 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 you keep raising the bar in terms of like the high end stuff like like everything else benefits from it are so. vests going the way of the dodo what vests no way man no way vests are still vests cool? are coming back vests are coming back in a big way all right my man jesse up there jesse he's bringing it back he is he is he is the man behind if 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 this... uh if 10 years from now everybody's wearing a vest it's because you Jesse. can credit Jesse Howler with that, period. Right, Jesse? Uh, hey, while we're talking, folks up there, got to give a shout out to my man, Jim Massiello. Jim, I'm sorry if I butchered the last name, but but Jim is a big, big fan of the podcast. Really? Yeah, listens well, to it all the time. Uh, he's got about maybe an hour to and from work each day, which is a beautiful ride, but uh, listens to the podcast. So that's what, like four miles? <laughs> No, that's not. That's how it would be here. Oh. There, that could be. You could go like a hundred miles. <laughs> what? That's unfathomable. Yeah, yeah. There's no. There's no. There's no such thing as like a traffic light up there. I don't. I don't know. Traffic jam. There, no traffic jam would be like if you, if while you were driving you ate like like toast and jam, that would be like a traffic jam. I don't get it. It doesn't exist. I just don't understand. It doesn't exist. But uh, but anyway, Jim is a big fan, listens to the podcast all Thank the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. And, and as a matter of fact, it's like when I got up there, it was like after we got to know each other, and Jim works over in like the IT side of things, keeps us all going, actually. Uh, his, him and his crew are really cool. 
Um, but uh, it didn't take long as we got to know each other where he was like, wait, wait, you know Rob? And I'm like, yeah, I know Rob. He's like one of my buddies. He's, <laughs> but anyway, he's like, uh, so he's a big, big fan of what you do, man. Fantastic. So, Jim, what's up, man? <laughs> I, oh, and I told him I'd bring him some swag of some kind. So like no pressure, but like Damsels. whatever damsels your drift boat like whatever does he want some uh overly seasoned tikka masala from tonight i could freeze some i went a little overboard with the gar masala and the ginger well he might be happy with that but like some snowy damsels are probably pretty good all right we'll work know? on that <laughs> but uh but anyways no as far as trends you know another big trend and i mean like sometimes these things get like i i suppose from the outside looking in sometimes things look like just marketing things or whatever. But I will say for sure, there is a major, major um, effort, uh, particularly by uh, some some of the lady anglers that work for us and have for a long time. This, this whole like 50-50, uh, which basically the 50-50 initiative is this idea of like just making it not abnormal to see um, women fly fishing. I mean, we all know women who are quite good at fly fishing, but to make it to where it's not even like a, oh, hey, that, that, that girl fly fishes or whatever, where it's just kind of like that lady anglers are just anglers like guy anglers are anglers. It's not strange to see or abnormal. Um, and so this, it's the idea of like getting towards the idea where one day anglers are just anglers and there's just as many women doing it as men doing it. And, and, um, and so there are a, a lot of folks behind that um at orvis who, who have very very pure hearts and motives with it and i think it's a really cool thing to see and i think that you just are seeing more um more more women picking it up and also more women that have been doing it for a long time just being recognized for being as much of an angler as anybody else so i'd say half a beer tie even more half sometimes as women yeah, that's what I always said, this too. It's a big you know, demographic. You know, as I got to know more about, like, what was going on, I, I just thought, like, yeah, cool. That's what I was seeing, you know? I mean, like, in, in schools, classes, 101, stuff like that at the shop, it was, like, it was it really kind of was 50-50. But that's sort of, like, when you're opening anything up, if, if you're, I don't know, for me, I just kind of never differentiated uh, if there was somebody who was in the store. I mean, if they walked three steps in, I just sort of, like, assumed they were an angler until they said they weren't and so but i think that that's the idea um it's not just like an orvis thing i mean it's more of like a like a a challenge to like all of the fly fishing world to just kind of be open to and and inviting um Absolutely. to like everybody that wants to do it so and i know you've been kind of into that for a long time too but so as far as but as far as trends go i definitely see that um taking like you know, taking root in a way that hasn't before. Fly lines have definitely advanced. You used to just open up a catalog, Orvis, any other company, floating, double taper. Right, right, right. Bass, pike, musky, tarpon. And now it's, it's almost yeah. like you need to have 13 reels with different lines on them. Yeah, or have a good loop to loop so you can switch them out. Yeah, it's the fly line evolution is just, insane to me well i'm a big line geek by the way like i just i'm fascinated with and enamored with lines because i've always thought of it like this it's kind of like it's kind of like if you have a 12 gauge shotgun you can shoot like infinite amounts of different type of shot out of it to do different things so if you have like a like i guess i'm using the 12 gauge as an example of like if you have a workhorse gun you can you can change what you shoot out of it to match a lot of different things, whether it's bird or clays or freaking buckshot, you know, or slugs, you know, in big game, right? So like, so you have this one versatile gun, but it's only versatile because you shoot different things out of it, right? Similarly, I think a lot of times people get a fly rod and they only put like the rated line on it and for only the rated purpose or whatever. And then they buy another rod and put the same rate of line on it and for, I mean, like for, like for whatever that rod is and stuff. And I always looked at it like if you have a couple of good rods and you explore lines, you can put a lot of different lines on, on the same rod 
and do like way different stuff. So like if you had a five weight, you know, you can cast a five weight trout line, it's gonna do it really well. But you can put a seven weight bass line on it and throw big bugs. You can put uh, five weights, we were throwing 250, you know, depth charge lines on a five weight. Like, is that on paper too much? Well, maybe, but that's, like just- That's fun for Shad. Do it, it works fine. So like the more people look into fly lines and the more people realize that oh, you know what, I'm not limited to, like, the number that's on the rod or the thing that I bought it for. It's like, if you learn about fly lines and you learn what fly lines can do for you, you can take one rod and you can throw, like, way, way different flies and you can get them at way different depths and you can fish them in different ways. So, yeah, I I, I think that fly lines have come a very long way and I think that part two of that is people starting to realize that you don't necessarily always need to buy a whole new setup to do something different it's like look at the rods and reels that you have buy good ones when you do it but look at fly lines as being a, a way that you can really experiment with and and perform different tasks with the it's rods like, you already have like i got my legs they're pretty good but i can wear flip-flops today for casual you can go put on some running shoes i can go put on some cleats you can put your steel-toed kangaroo uh, i love those boots, boots. i can put on my wellies you have the basic tool for them, but you just change up the specific thing for each individual activity. Right. So right. you can put on like a scratched head for when you need it to bust out a two-hander. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going for some stripers down at Fletcher's. Let me put on a 350 grain. Yeah. I think that actually, you know, you bring up the two-handed thing and you've brought it up a couple of times. And I think that that's where a lot of my... Um, I, I was a line geek before two-handed stuff, but I think that two-handed stuff... Two handed rods taught me uh, a lot about about fly lines and rated fly lines versus like what you could like the 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 how you could put different lines on the same rod and do way different things and and what I mean by that is you know two handed rods for a good long while um, people that are into it know that there's such a thing called a grain window and the grain window is basically like this fly rod is good for fly lines that are between let's say you know 420 and um 550 grains that's a window that's not like that's a range so it's not like a like though this is only a five weight so i think that two-handed rods uh, break you out of this idea of thinking like oh this is a seven this is an eight this is a nine instead it's like oh this is this casts a wide range of lines as long as it's within this grain window and once i sort of started to understand that with two-handed fly rods or like the spay rods and stuff i started applying the same mentality to like my single hand rods and i was like wow all of these rods have a grain window they all have a range so um so I think that I think that that's just it. Once you start realizing that, number one, there's no rules, and just try something. Uh, and two, I, I think when I used to fish a lot of conventional gear, like you know, non-fly fishing stuff, like spinning rods, casting rods, they always had like a, a range of lure weights. So it would be like if you had a medium action spinning rod, and it would say like from a quarter ounce to like, uh, like a, a quarter to a half, or three eighths to three quarters or something like whatever size rod you had it was like throw lures that way between this range and this range right so you weren't limited to like one thing and i think that the more we think of fly rods that way the more we think of like okay cool this this rod has a baseline of a five weight but like i can throw a seven weight line on they're it they're more throw... versatile than people think they are yeah yeah they don't know what number is printed on them like only we do so, uh, and I can say for sure, without hesitation, that every modern fly rod out there is going to cast fly lines at a minimum. It's going to comfortably cast fly lines at least two line weights heavier, and in some cases more. I mean, I'd take a five weight and put an eight weight bass line on it. You'd be blown away by, you wouldn't, you know. But, uh, but I encourage people out there that are listening to try it, like, you know, if you have a five weight and an eight weight at home, and those are the two rods you have, take the eight weight line and put it on the five weight and see what happens. I, I think you'll be blown away by what it does. So, yeah, I think that fly lines are one of those places where, even if you don't invest in lots and lots of rods, like 
get to know lines because they really, really have evolved a lot. And uh, there's a lot you can do when you're just kind of like manipulating plastic goop on a string, basically, which is what a fly line is, and like putting more of it here and less of it there and things like that to achieve a certain purpose. It's not a, uh, it's not gimmicky. It's really like, it's it's taking probably one of the most important part of, parts of the whole uh, setup and and fine tuning it to perform a task. It's, it's like a guitar and you're just tuning it to a different way. Yeah, you're 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 really getting into the guitar playing stuff. That, yeah, I've I've got like my six six or seven chords I've learned over the years. Well, that's that's enough progressed. to play every punk rock song that's ever yeah existed. And my guitar pick is a gift card that I cut up. I'm Ooh. hoping over spring break at my neighbor's house, in the Outer Banks will teach me a song. You know what's another word for a guitar pick? I don't. Plectrum. A plectrum. Plectrum. Yeah, it sounds more sophisticated. Like, if you were to say, like, I, you know, I really, I prefer a, a, a medium plectrum. Is that like plecoptera, like stoneflies? You lost me. I, I'm not, Latin I'm not, for plec is, is tent. I think that you should go with that, actually, because nobody's going to know when you say right. it. <laughs> Half the time, my wife doesn't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, <laughs> seriously? Like, we were at a restaurant once, and they had steelhead salmon on the menu. <laughs> And she was kicking me under the table because I wanted to argue with it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm on that note, like I'm a big fan of a, a TU initiative from like a bunch of years back, which was uh, they, they call it a vote with your fork. And and anymore, ever since that, actually, and ever since like a couple trips to Alaska, um, I really value uh, if, if the salmon on a menu is wild caught salmon or if it's farm raised and if it's farm raised i i won't buy it and it's like um, puppy mill food yeah but it's it's incredible and it makes me wonder it's... how many folks out there just don't know the difference when i worked at the fda doing web pages for blind people and amongst other things i came across a document that i had to make a website out of and it was if you feed straight up color changing pigments that go to salmon like to make their flesh pink if you feed them to rats the rats die hmm. and i was like huh so you can feed them to rats and rats die but you feed them to salmon which people eat and that's okay yeah yeah that was not grass generally regarded as safe huh that was before my my fishing years wow it's like putting strychnine in the guacamole yeah. And that's another office space one for you. <laughs> you put strychnine in the guacamole. Swing like tabler. Mm. Any other fishing things we should talk about before I go to non-fishing questions? Uh, well, I feel like half of our podcast has been about non-fishing, which is which is what's great. It's about the balance of things, you know. Um, any other, any other fishing-related ones? Uh. How do you fit everything in a fishing trip into that one travel case? Oh, that's a good question. So I've been I've been kind of like a carry on only guy for a long time. Um, and and this includes it's, that's easy if you're going to the tropics because like what do you really need for the tropics as far as clothing and stuff? But same two carry ons is what I was carrying to Alaska too. And I would go there for like 15 days or so. And I would carry a backpack, which was not a big backpack either. This is like, you know, the, the, the typical, like you know, maybe 2000, uh, cubic inch one. So whatever that is probably like 20 something liters, excuse me. So, um, uh, I think that, I think number one is is uh, when you go on a fishing trip, you don't need to pack like if you're going for seven days, you don't need to pack like seven pairs of pants, and you don't have to pack like uh, you know seven t-shirts and seven of whatever, right? Like you have to like know your layering systems. Uh, I could go on a week long trip somewhere, even if it involves like you know cold climates and waders and boots and all that stuff, uh, with. You know, maybe one set of base layers and a couple pair of pants, um, and 
like one major layering or maybe two major layering systems like as far as like you know your 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 lighter midweight base layer and then like uh, uh another sort of like long sleeve shirt on top of that and then some sort of like a sweater or pullover and then you've got your puffy jacket and your rain jacket right so um so that like as far as clothing goes you can really really limit what you're putting together because you're either camping at which point who cares or you are um going to a lodge or something which you know if you're paying a bunch of grand to go to a lodge or something then like they've got laundry so like just if you need to like cycle through your layering a couple of times just like have them like have it washed and stuff it's not that so i think that people will way overpack in terms of like the clothing and stuff that they'll take on a trip and then as far as rods go you know these these carry-all cases uh well you can get at a minimum you can get six rods in there and as many reels but even if you put six rods and six reels into one of these things, you still have a lot of space left over. So you can put fly boxes and pliers and um, like spools of tippet and leaders and things like that. But even once you get all that in there, you're not done. I usually will take like, you know, maybe one of the pairs of pants and like one, one full layering system and like kind of fold it and lay it in there too. So uh, I know that in one case I've got everything I need for clothing and everything like that to go fishing. You know, plus, plus I've got fishing, you know, all my gear, my rods and reels and stuff. And then in the backpack, I've got waders, boots, and then a bunch of other, you know, I mean, my other layers and stuff. Right. And then, uh, and usually these backpacks have like an outer pocket or whatever. And that's where your puffy jacket and your rain jacket go. So I think that when it comes down to it, if you think through like what it is that you're taking and i still feel like a lot of times i take more than i need on these trips um so even when it comes down to it i, I think it's just about like figuring out how to use every little inch of like the the bags you're taking and so like i'll take my wading boots and and line them with a plastic bag and then stuff them full of socks and underwear and stuff like that you know what i mean there's no reason to pack hollow wading boots like stuff them full and if you put a bag in there, the, everything slides all the way into the toe and everything. Like, you can really pack them full. Um, so I think think critically about how you're actually filling the space, making sure that there's no hollow pockets. And then think critically about whether or not you really need, like, that, you know, fourth pair of pants and uh, underwear. I try to bring as much underwear as I can. Alternate inside out versus right side out <laughs> alternate days like i said if you're camping who cares but uh but just but, be sure to wear brown underwear but you know what's funny is like people pay a lot of <laughs> brown due to brown um the so uh, there's no racing stripes that show up you won't know <laughs> um you know it's funny we pay a lot of money for these things that are like quick dry and it's sort of like wash them in the sink or whatever like let's be honest with ourselves how many people actually like wash their clothes in the sink my father-in-law well, you can do it you can do it. That's what I'm saying. Like, like so. Like, don't just buy the clothes that you can wash in the sink. Like, wash the clothes in the sink and hang them up to dry. They'll be dry. You know what I mean? It's like, so you you just. I guess it depends on on the goal. But if you want to pack minimal, and I have, I have been in situations where I've been flying to like um, like on an Alaska trip or something, and we've had plane issues and had to deplane. I have my two carry-ons. I've been able to get off of the plane with my two carry-ons and then get rerouted and just hop on another plane and go. Whereas everybody else, all their gear is still sitting Jacked in the belly of the plane. They right. have to wait. They have to all that other stuff. And I've been gone already moving on. So, uh, yeah, carry on if you can. You get two. You get one carry-on and one personal item. Well, that personal item, as long as it can be stashed under the seat, that's your backpack. So rod case goes up overhead and, like, the backpack goes under the plane i mean under the uh under the seat all right yeah yeah all right let's go to some alternate questions now okay when you order a hot dog do you put ketchup or mustard on it neither really what's your hot dog topping well i like sauerkraut okay sauerkraut's really good well i i am sort of like plain jane a lot of things so if it's a good hot dog doesn't need hot anything. dog doesn't need anything at all all right but sauerkraut cheese onions that, that's really good on a hot dog. I almost went to the Vienna Inn yesterday with my neighbor. To what? Vienna Inn. Oh, yeah, Vienna Inn. Yep. It has not changed. 
Well, some things shouldn't. All right, worst place you've ever fished? Worst place I've ever fished. Hmm. Um. Oh, man. Let's come back to it. If you left something at home on a fishing trip that would completely screw you, what would it be? My cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's so ironic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I said that for everybody out there that knows me. And I'd be completely screwed. Uh, probably, um, probably, I have this really great stainless steel mug that I've taken like everywhere. And this is pre Yeti. Like, there was no such thing as Yeti. Yetis were still abominable snowmans at the time. And uh, and so this is just like a stainless steel mug that goes with me pretty much everywhere. And it, it's equally well with coffee as it is with whiskey and things like that. And I feel like if I went somewhere and I didn't have it, uh, I would I would certainly notice that it wasn't there. And I'd be bummed about it. One day, everyone's going to be required to carry a cup. But Starbucks puts, what, like 60 million cups in a landfill a day? Hmm, like ev sad. eventually everyone's gonna have to carry their own cup I well think. i think we should i think we should i mean uh you know cups are very simple things and like the materials and things that there are out there now it's like you know, get a nice cup and carry it with you i i this this mug i'm talking about uh like goes really everywhere and i i still drink from it every day it's like my coffee mug that i take yeah, so like we don't need like uh yeah, disposable anything anymore. You should, you should go the way the dodo about. sound. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any irrational phobias? Yeah, getting eaten by a crocodile. Fresh. Which which in fairness, um I will fish in places where there's crocodiles, but like I have been irrationally fearful. Like head on a swivel. In places where I know the crocodiles exist, like within, like within, um, they call you Captain Hook. <laughs> within, like, you know, hundreds of miles or so. But like, if I know, I'm in Alaska, but I know there's caimans. Yeah, I'm not quite that bad. I'm not quite that bad. But like, but like, even even wading flats where I know that there are crocodiles, like somewhere. Like I just. I'm like looking behind me and like my little mud trail, like there's a freaking crocodile in there. Or like I went swimming one time. Uh, I, I, I did like an inland thing in Belize and I was like um, going looking at ruins and stuff. And there was this place which was like this super pure, nice, like mineral rich water. And you could like go and swim and stuff like that. It was really pretty great. But I was 100% terrified that I was going to get just like snatched by a crocodile. And like, I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's like, you know, Crocodile and D memories, or if it's like um, you know, watching those shows on on Discovery where it's like like when animals attack and stuff. But like, yeah, I can see it happening. What's the best sandwich you've ever had? You know, actually, lately I actually had this. There's a there's this random little place in New York, not far from me, and it's called the Man of Kent, and it's like this British guy, uh, like the, as like the kind of the logo thing, and they make this. Um, this like cheese steak thing on a, on like a roll with like caramelized onions and stuff. Yeah. Oh my. I mean, it is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You when you come up, we'll go to Man of Kent. If you had a superhero power to make you a better angler, what would you choose? Mm, probably, um, I would have a lateral line. I think I would have a lateral line myself. So if I needed to, like, I could like, because I figure like that's what makes all of the fish really good at finding my fly. And so if I had a lateral line, I could probably find them even better. Is there a food you will never eat? Hmm. Uh, well, at one time I existed by a mantra that I would never eat anything that I ever used for bait. And this was back in, like, in fairness, you know, I mean, fly fishing was only part of my life for a lot of it. And, and so I had this idea that, like, if I, if I use it for bait, I won't eat it. And then that all went by the wayside when me and my buddy Mike Guerra were on a trip to, um, we were going to, I think we were going to Myrtle Beach one time. And we stopped off at a place and I inadvertently ate chicken livers, fried chicken livers. They weren't bad. But once I knew that I ate them, and we used to use a lot of chicken livers for catfishing. Right. 
So like then all of a sudden I had already eaten chicken livers. Um, so so that was what I used to live by, and that that went out that went out the window when I ate chicken livers. Um, and of course calamari. Well, who doesn't eat calamari? And and you fish with squid. Uh, but a food that I will not ever eat. Um, hmm. Chilled monkey brain. Dr. Jones. <laughs> If you had a day to redo a fishing trip, what trip would that be? Hmm. A day to redo it. Well, redo it for any reason at all? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, there was a time that, that I did a, uh, there was a time that I did, like, there was this remote salmon camp. It was an Alaska trip, and we had uh, two, like, two groups back-to-back. And the first group, we had, like, the most unbelievable unbelievable conditions like it was so good and um and then the second group of guys came in and with them came like basically an alaska version of like a tropical storm and it blew out the place and basically when you're in a remote camp and and you have chocolate milk like rivers and stuff like that it's um it's not it's not great you know i mean you really like you really want and and i could have cared less about me hooking another thing ever in my life but when you have people and you just go, oh, man, this is really tough. Like, if I could redo a fishing trip, I would have I would have somehow shifted the days so that each each group of folks got like some pretty uh, like some of those unbelievable days. Because, you know, let's face it, conditions are conditions and fishing is fishing. And so, like, you're always going to end up with those kind of things where it's not not ideal. But it really sucked to have one group have the best ever conditions and one group have the worst ever conditions. So I guess off the cuff, if there was a way to make that more balanced, it would have been cool. If you had access to a phone booth with a man named Rufus, oh, he could punch Ruf- you back in time to go somewhere where you could fish before modern humans ruined that environment, where would you go? So I could fish with beef oven? Beef oven? Nice. Or, or, or Genghis Khan. Or, or, uh, or uh, Aristotle, uh, what is he, geek? <laughs> oh, man. Um, you dust in the wind. <sighs> Dude. You know what? I'll, I'm going to answer this as a two-parter. Uh, the, the Virginian and East Coaster and me would have wanted to fish for a Salter Brook trout somewhere in the lower 48. That would be pretty cool. Um and i think um i think maybe maybe it's also being sort of like east coast here but i think it would be righteous to hook a uh an atlantic in the lower 48 as well excellent yeah yeah, so that would have been cool. Like, I, I wish, I wish that those. I mean, and I understand industrialization, and I understand like how things sort of happen, but, um, but I can only imagine what an environment the Eastern Seaboard was before all that. Who's your celebrity doppelganger if you were to see you fully hair suit versus shaved? No one really knows what you really look like. Huh. You've been incognito for how long? Uh, well, I don't even know. I mean, I mean even your brother, he's got some chops. Yeah. He he's follicularly uh gifted as well. Yeah, he can he can he's grown a beard or two. Like it looks good. Yeah. I think you should do it again. Um Your mom's not the bearded lady, is she? No. Nope. She's lovely. Um celebrity. Well, I don't even know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I've been, I've been, I've been compared to folks. There was like the, who, who was the old guy that, that like threw the baseball for the Nationals? It was like the the guy with the big beard and stuff. Like people okay. used to call me that guy, Jason Worth. Yeah, that guy. Like right. Like, I can I dig even, it. Uh, like I mean, if you're listening, hey Jason, good on you. I'm sorry I didn't know um, your name, but uh, so I used to get that. Um, caveman you know I don't know I mean I think like beards are sort of like they sort of come and go but I I, I just kind of always had one okay when did it start mm. puberty bar mitzvah age 
No, I, you know, I, I started growing what I consider to be reputable facial hair when I was about like um, maybe 16 or so when I would go and buy smokes from, from highs. <laughs> and I really thought that I, you know, was pulling it off. But now I think of like, what did I look like? It was probably just like peach fuzz and Excuse stuff. Excuse me, sir. I'd like a pack yeah, of right, lucky exactly. strikes. The, um, we, we, we smoked camel lights then at that time. I'm not sure why, but, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I also recall being about 15 and, and being very proud of like a mustache I was growing. And, and then like, I did a sailor dive into the swimming pool, like in the lower in like the shallower area, which is just, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do a sailor dive. Like that's with your hands, not out in front of you. And I, I went right down to the bottom and I, and I, and I basically skinned off right in the middle you like, the like middle. hitler i had a hitler scab that's terrible it was really bad it was bad i mean like because i just went right down to the bottom and i but i remember being so bummed that i like undid what i consider to be 15 years worth of work in one sailor die is there a team you'd want to see win a the national championship of what sport any man I just I don't really know sports very well at all. Uh, a team I'd like to see win a national championship. Um, no, I don't know. Are there any urban legends for where you live now? Urban legends? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that I I don't know of like a particular like Vermont like chupacabra or anything like that. That, that would be cool. But I'll, I'll take that in a different direction, which is I firmly believe that the eastern cougar is not extinct. It's been said that it's been extinct for a long time. My daughter's teacher almost hit a mountain lion so down I, by so, Bull Run so, so I believe, Marina. I believe that 100%. But there are those people, those skeptics, who would say that, oh, well, that must be some sort of a western cat that's been relocated or a, an oh, no. escaped one from, like, you They've know, been house from or whatever. Us. So here's, I'm going to give you my theory in a nutshell. Because I, I know for a fact where you can find um, mountain lions. But, uh, but regardless, in terms of their DNA, in terms of whether or not it's an eastern cat or a western cat, right? My theory is simple. It's been widely held for a long time that the eastern mountain lion or eastern cougar has been extinct. If you, in the densely populated eastern seaboard, if you all of a sudden discover one, and it's provable, proof positive, an eastern cougar, all of a sudden it's an endangered species. And if it's an endangered species, then, uh, then, then that means that it's protected. And if it's protected, then that means that a lot of industrial practices need to stop or change or halt. So I believe that the reason why people are very or, or are less inclined to accept the existence of an eastern cougar is because um, because it would it would have significant ramifications for like daily life if you could prove that one existed. So instead, it's sort of like uh, it's it's kind of the equivalent of like the like the oh it's not a ufo it's swamp gas reflecting off a weather balloon or something it's kind of like the oh you didn't see a cougar you saw like a bobcat or you saw a lynx or you saw something else and it's like nah, everybody knows the difference i mean it's got a freaking four foot long tail and it's yeah 100 pounds it's a mountain lion i don't want to see one no i don't want to either ever but i know i know melody and i like came very close to a lair one yeah, so my daughter's teacher was riding his motorcycle through Clifton last year and almost hit one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's like eight miles away from here. Eight mile. Like yeah. Bull Run, uh, Overlook, all that ain't that far. No, I so I believe that they're out there. So that's not really an urban legend. But I think that if you go up to um, Vermont as well or New York or places like that, I'm, I'm certain of it. All right. Anything else you want to close with? No, you know, I think that I think that this is sort of like a more of a, a, a greater like a greater philosophical thing. But it's like I think that whether it's fly fishing or whether it's, um, you know, any other subject, I I think uh, I just encourage folks to just to be positive. You know, I mean, I think that like the world's full of curmudgeons and um, 
you know, lots of folks that are not happy about stuff. And when we happen to have this thing, like in, in fly fishing, we happen to have this thing that we're like pretty stoked on. And, and so I think like, um, you know, do whatever you can to, um, to, to let that sort of be the, uh, be the, the overriding, uh, I don't know, like way that you look at things, like just kind of like be, be positive. I, I, I like positive folks and I like being around positive people and there's a lot of things to be, um, you know, bummed about, but like, I, I, whenever I'm around people in the fly fishing world and I, and I see people who are negative, I'm just like, man, why <laughs> we have this thing that we're like, that's just really pretty great. And we like sharing with people and we like, um, experiencing for ourselves. So like yeah, stay positive. I'll end it with that, man. All right, man. Cool. Where can Rob, people find you at Orvis if they want to book a trip? Uh, so you could get me, um, the, my, my email at Orvis is devaladd at orvis.com. So that'll get right to me. And then, um, basically just get on orvis.com and look at trips and schools and you'll get over to Orvis Adventures. You get our 800 number and, you know, or just email Orvis Adventures at orvis.com. 800-556-8630? No, that's not us. I gotta, I gotta look at the. Um, I don't call us very much, so I gotta actually like, pull out one of my cards here. It's uh, eight hundred five four seven four three two two. There we go. That's Orvis Adventures. Yeah. All right. Give Dan a call. Thanks, Rob. It's been an honor and a privilege and a pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.